Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the Talking Sira podcast. So in our last episode we discussed the migrations to Abyssinia and we spoke about the reasons for the migration. Uh, one of the reasons that many of the Sira books uh, mention obviously is that uh, the Muslims were fleeing persecution uh, as the environment really became harsh and hostile and the Quraysh uh, were not making it easy on the Muslims. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave permission to the Muslims to uh, leave uh, for another land, a land of justice where there was a just king in an Najashi. Uh, but another reason we discussed, um, a reason that is mentioned by many scholars and classical scholars, is that the Messenger وسلم, was seeking an alternative stronghold in case the Muslims were driven out of Mecca or the Da'wah became stale. And it was a political action uh, to really show that the Muslims uh, were not being treated well by the the fellow tribesmen, um, and it did have an uh, have a consequence where a lot of the outer tribes were viewing uh, the Quraysh in uh, you know in 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 a bad sense really, and that the Muslims were being persecuted. So it had uh, quite a lot of significance, and we mentioned uh, some of the reasons. Uh, we also spoke about how the Quraysh uh, and the enemies of Allah didn't let up. They didn't just leave the Muslims to go to Abyssinia and just leave them alone. In fact, they followed the Muslims and they tried to convince an Najashi to send the Muslims back. Uh, and they essentially bribed an Najashi. They gave him gifts. Uh, they tried to convince him. And with eloquent speech, uh, you know, they sent their best man, who's Amr ibn al As, who was a, a shrewd politician. And, and they tried to convince him to. Uh, to convince Najashi to send the Muslims back with them. And it really demonstrated and showed us and ha- to, showed us that uh, the enemies of Allah and those who hate Islam, they are not happy until we give up all our deen. Even if we were to leave the land, uh, they will follow us. They will uh, do their utmost to continue to persecute us until we left Islam altogether. And we find that uh, this happens even today. Uh, we also spoke about how Jafar ibn Abi Talib, uh, he really showed great hikmah and wisdom in the way he won the heart of an Najashi, the way he selected certain verses of the Qur'an to uh, pull the heartstrings of an Najashi and he left the envoys of Quraysh embarrassed. Uh, they were left empty-handed in that uh, an Najashi uh, you know, banished them away and told them to take their gifts and, and, and said that he would not leave the Muslims. So it highlights the importance of our hikmah in our da'wah and always having that non-compromising stance that uh, Jafar ibn Abi Talib did. For example, uh, when everyone bowed to a Najashi, even the Quraysh bowed, uh, the Muslims didn't. And they held strong to their principles, yet they showed hikmah in their da'wah uh, to convince a Najashi to give them protection. So we should you know, obviously do the same, despite the circumstances we might find ourselves in. So moving on to today and the topic of today is a, a sad topic really. It's a, it's a calamitous uh, year for the Prophet وسلم, which we know in the seerah um, as the year of grief or Amal Huzn. Uh, this was the year in which three great calamities befell the Messenger uh, which didn't only impact him personally but it also had a, an impact on the da'wah and his mission. So let's take each one uh, as they occur. occurred. The first event that this, the books of Sira mention is the death of Abu Talib. Uh, and he died in the, tenth year, or the end of the 10th year of the Prophet ﷺ's da'wah. And obviously um, he was very close to the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, he wasn't just his uncle, he was very much like a father figure. Because as we mentioned in the earlier episodes, uh, Abu Talib became um, became like the the parent or the uh, guardian of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam at a very young age. Uh, I think the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was around the age of eight when he went under to, under the guardianship of Abu Talib because of the death of both his parents as well as uh, Abdul Muttalib, who was his grandfather. So he, you know, Abu Talib took on him under his care and treated him as his own child. 
So on a, even on a personal level, we can just imagine how much grief and sorrow this must have caused the, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But to compel this and to make it worse, the death also had an impact on the da'wah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Abu Talib was the central protection of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was a senior member of Quraysh. So he was able to give that protection and for it to have an impact. So the, the leaders of the Quraysh and the, the ardent enemies of Islam weren't able to really harm the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as much as they wanted to. And even though Abu Talib wasn't a Muslim, he gave protection to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he allowed the Messenger to carry on with his da'wah and call to Islam. And this, you know, this was a great aid to Islam because it allowed uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to really, with uh, a clear, you know, path towards other Muslims without being persecuted or harmed or, or for there to be too many barriers for him doing this. So his death in fact uh, was a great calamity both on a personal level but also uh, in terms of the da'wah and in terms of what happened uh, when Abu Talib was on his deathbed dying uh, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam came by his side and he tried to convince his dear uncle to embrace Islam and you know he was telling him to say the shahada to utter those words so that he could testify for his uncle in front of Allah on yawm al qiyamah but, um, you know, Abu Talib was uh, reluctant. And to make it worse, on the other side of his bed, um, the leaders of Quraysh, including Abu Jahl, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of chief enemy of Islam, uh, they continued to tell Abu Talib to stand firm on his religion, the religion of his forefathers, Abdul Muttalib, and not to kind of uh, leave, leave the religion of his forefathers. And they threatened him to, that they would disgrace his name if he embraced Islam and really just whispering in his ears trying to convince him not to embrace Islam. And even though Abu Talib knew that Muhammad وسلم, was the messenger of Allah um, and he did want to, um, you know, he didn't want to hurt the feelings of Muhammad وسلم, even said, it's reported that he said to the messenger, were it not for the Quraysh saying that I only said it out of relentlessness, I would have given you delight by saying it. So you could tell that Abu Talib really wanted to delight the Messenger of Allah by saying the Shahada. But despite uh, the Messenger's attempts uh, to convince him, Abu Talib unfortunately died uh, a mushrik. He died upon um, the paganism of his forefathers. And, you know, this obviously caused even more sorrow for the Messenger وسلم, because now this father figure, this beloved uncle of the Messenger has now died upon Islam and this caused a lot of angst for the Messenger and he, um, you know, made dua to Allah that uh, he forgive him and, you know, he was making dua to Allah for Abu Talib even though Abu Talib died a mushrik. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the verse إِنَّكَ لَا تَحْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاء وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُحْتَدِينَ Indeed, O Muhammad, you do not guide whom you, who you like, but Allah guides whom he wills, and he is most knowing of the rightly guided. So, you know, the Messenger وسلم, was only sent as a guide, and Allah is reminding him that you cannot guide anyone, even your close uncle, even the one who is most beloved to you, you cannot guide him. Because... Allah is the one who guides and it's, it is in the willpower of people to uh, you know, take that guidance and to, and to embrace Islam. It isn't upon the Messenger وسلم, and it isn't upon us. In our da'wah we shouldn't force or feel too compelled that we want to make someone Muslim or even guide them to the straight path. Because at the end of the day, you know, our, we have to give the message. We have to give the message clearly and bluntly. And the rest we have to leave to the person and to Allah. And, you know, that is beyond our ability. And this gives us um, a clear example here where the Messenger Sallallahu wasn't even able to make dua for Abu Talib or even was able to guide him because it is, it is in the path, you know, it is in the hands of Allah. So, so his uncle Abu Talib died a mushrik and this was mainly due to his pride and his ego of not being able to leave the religion of his forefathers, even though he knew the Prophet ﷺ was truthful. You know, for example, when it came to the boycott and the agreement being ripped up by the ants and the termites, you know, 
Abu Talib believed the Messenger when he told him this, and he used this as an evidence uh, with the Quraysh in order for the the boycott to come to an end. So, you know, we know that Abu Talib did have sympathy for the Messenger, but he wasn't able to utter those words. And, you know, this gives us a, a clear lesson to take from this incident that Abu Talib stayed upon the position of his forefathers, even though he knew the truth. And this is a mentality that many non-Muslims have, you know, this, this pride, this ego that I cannot be wrong, and they don't open their hearts to Islam. But we even see this mentality amongst us as Muslims. We have, some of us have this mentality where, you know, we have inherited Islam from our parents, like a culture, and from our forefathers, you could argue. And we believe in it, we are Muslim, no one is doubting that, but whether we have embraced Islam in its decisive way, in the, in the way that we should embrace Islam, that we know it to be the truth, and everything from Islam, from the Quran and from the Sunnah, we embrace it wholeheartedly, and anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, we stay away from, and anything that the Messenger has told us to stay away from, we stay away from. Have we really embraced it like this? Or do we, you know, many of us, from especially the Indian subcontinent, we may have taken on practices that our forefathers had been been doing, for example. And just the, the most obvious one that many, not even not even just from uh, kind of South Asian part of the world, all across the, the globe, uh, due to the decline of Islam, uh, many of us were taught an Islam that was very spiritual in nature, very ritualistic, um, that it was only about the salah and the zakah and our personal worship. And we embraced this side of Islam and didn't really question the fact that actually Islam is a comprehensive deen. It caters for all aspects of our life and we have to embrace all of Islam. So when it comes to that, when we, you know, as Muslims, when we hear that Islam is comprehensive, we should base our judgment not on what our forefathers and our parents told us, because they will have had the greatest of intentions, no doubt, but we should base it, uh, we should base it on this strength of evidence. Um, and when we're presented with this truth and that Islam is comprehensive and we do have a duty to implement the whole of Islam, we should embrace it all wholeheartedly um, so that we can please Allah. And this is obviously what we're seeking to do in our life, to please Allah, to worship Allah in the best uh, of our ability and not just stick to what we have been told uh, at a young age, for mm. example. So that's a clear lesson that we can take from the death of Abu Talib. Another thing that it really demonstrates uh, in this incident and what is highlighted to us is that, you know, the whispers of shaitan are very strong. And when we think of shaitan, often we think of the jinn and, you know, Iblis himself. But in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the shaitan or the shayateen uh, are from the jinn and the men. You know, we have voices not only from the jinn, but also from men who are you know, part of the army of shaitan. They, they uh, aid the enemies, they aid shaitan. And we have many voices, like we had here in the case of Abu Talib, where, you know, Abu Jahl and the, the chief shaitan, you could argue, from the Quraysh, he was doing his utmost to convince Abu Talib not to embrace the truth, not to listen to his messen- uh, to, the, to his nephew, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, same can be said in our case, that Yes, we have the shaitan and the shayateen from amongst the jinn whispering to us constantly to do bad and to be lazy and not to fulfill our command uh, to Allah. But we also have it from amongst the men. We have it from mankind who tell us, you know, don't uh, waste your time on da'wah. Don't worry, you know, take your family as more important, your parents, your children, your job. All of these things, you know, people will tell us that not to really take Islam and the comprehensiveness of Islam and the political aspect of Islam that seriously just do your personal ibadah and pray and and that is it and these are from the whispers of shaitan because Islam is much more than this and we know that to worship Allah it isn't sufficient just to pray it isn't sufficient just to give zakah once in our once in a year or to do hajj once in our lifetime that isn't sufficient Islam is so much more than this and we will find from the seerah that you know, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam exemplified this and when when we get to the end of the seerah and when we read more books about the seerah we'll recognise that many of us have been sold an Islam that is totally 
against what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed us. Um, so again, you know, we have similar whispers of shaitan on the shayateen even today uh, as Abu Talib had. And let's just pray that we are not stung by this. We are not, um, you know, we will have whispers, but we can stand strong against these whispers and do what is required and, um, you know, don't let shaitan win. Don't let Iblis win, nor his army of shayateen win. So this was the first incident that happened that obviously caused great sorrow to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very sad. But shortly after, subhanAllah, you know, the, the books of Sirah say just within 40 days after the death of Abu Talib, in the same year, the beloved wife of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khadija radiallahu anha, passed away. And obviously this caused even, you know, more grief, you could argue, to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it was his beloved wife and, you know, we know how much he loved Khadija radiallahu anha. Um, you know, this was the only wife who he was with, you know, when he was with Khadija, he had no other wife, it was just Khadija and he had immense love for her. Um, and we know that when even before prophethood this love was there and even when he became a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um khadija supported the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam she was the first to embrace islam and to believe in him you know she didn't uh, when when he came back from the cave of hira she didn't doubt him she didn't say you're just making it up you you need some rest or whatever she believed him in him straight away and she supported him she wrapped up him up she took him to Waraka ibn Nawfal, as we remember, you know, from the previous episodes we spoke about. Um, and not only this, she supported him in uh, the da'wah even since then. And in terms of giving him financial support and wealth, you know, she was a trade, uh, wealthy tradeswoman. So she supported the da'wah in this sense. But also emotionally, uh, when he would have a hard, stay, hard, day, hard day's work of the da'wah, when he was being rejected by the Quraysh, when he was being seen, he, when he saw the companions being persecuted, he would come back, uh, you know, having a tough day of da'wah to his wife, who would comfort him, who would give him solace, who would explain to him that carry on, do what is required because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with you. And even after the death of Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would mention her often and would send gifts to her family and her friends. And even on one occasion, Aisha radiallahu anha, you know, may Allah bless her, became jealous and said some harsh words against, against Khadija, you know, along the lines of why do you always mention this old woman when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has replaced you, uh, replaced her with someone better. And she would say this to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa On one incident, this happened and um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa became very angry and red and, you know, uh, he, he said to Aisha, he responded that no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not replaced her with anyone better. She believed in me when everyone rejected me. She gave her wealth and in service of Islam whilst others withheld their wealth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me children through her. And when, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said this, Aisha radiallahu anha said she never ever bought up the name of Khadija one, never again, because she realized that, you know, Khadija had a certain place in the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that it would never be able to be challenged, not not any of the wives. Even though Aisha, radiallahu anha, was you know one of um, his most beloved, uh, no doubt, no doubt she was um, you know Umm al Mu'minin, and uh, a lot of uh, you know there's lots we can say about the benefits of Aisha. But just in this example, you can see that Khadija was uh, very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now that she passed away, obviously this has caused even more. Uh, sadness to the Prophet ﷺ. Not only did his uncle pass away, but even his beloved wife, uh, who gave him, you know, you could argue Abu Talib gave him the external support in terms of protection of the da'wah, um, and then Khadija gave him that internal support when it came to uh, either the wealth uh, for the da'wah, but also um, that emotional support when he when he needed it most. So after um, you know this happened. Uh, these two incidents happened. Obviously, it was a very precarious situation for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, just to kind of talk, speak a bit more about Khadija, um, before we move on to the next third event, uh, we, it's worth just 
you know, speaking a bit about Khadija a bit more and what it what lessons we can take. In this world of feminism, where we're being, you know, it's been shoved down our throats and women are being told that they need to be more like men. We really need to look to the likes of Khadija, uh, and not just Khadija, but the wives of the Prophet um, as our role models in Islam, for our sisters and our daughters. And even as men, we should look to these sisters as the ones we seek, whether it be in marriage or whether it be in our daughters growing up to be like these great women of Islam. And Khadija specifically was given a very high status in Islam. You know, she was given salam to by Jibreel alayhi salam himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one incident. And she supported her husband, like we were saying, in every way possible. Um, she supported the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the dawah with her wealth, with her, um, with her moral support, with her emotional support, in every way possible. possible. And... This is the kind of uh, woman, you know, we should have uh, as our role models and that our sisters should be looking up to because she is the one who embodies, uh, you know, someone who did continue to support her husband but also supported the da'wah. And this is an obligation not only upon the man but also upon the sisters. And the enemies of Islam, you know, often in the target and the attack on Islam the secular camp campaign against Islam is through the woman. Whether it be through programs around uh, liberalism and feminism and women's rights and freedom, you know, it's often through women. And this is why it's so important for our sisters and our daughters to remain firm upon their Islam. And it is the role of our, us as brothers to protect our sisters wherever possible, Where, whether it be physically protecting them because they are our easy target, and also intellectually because there's a clear campaign um, you know for example the other day it was a Danish minister who said that you know subhanallah that uh, you know women should be allowed the right of fornication you know sex before marriage obviously this is against Islam but they are based on their freedom and their rights and their women's rights uh, they they are pushing for our sisters to accept this and alhamdulillah you know many sisters will reject this and even brothers obviously would reject this so um, we just need to stay firm because there is a campaign. There is an, a very specific campaign through uh, women in Islam that the secularists are trying to push. And this is because they recognize that women and sisters are the first line of defense when it comes to Islam. Because they are the, the ones that are the first teacher of our children. Because they're the mothers. You know, The mothers are the first teachers of children. So they recognize that if they can corrupt, corrupt the mother then they are able to corrupt the entire future generation of Islam. And that is why they will focus their efforts in this regard. And a story, recent story of um, where the Muslim model, Halima Adan, who, who left the fashion industry and she spoke out against uh, the, the industry and the attempt to sexualize the hijab and all of this. And, you know, she spoke about all her mistakes that she made as well uh, in joining that industry. You know, one of the reasons she spoke out and, and she's actually left the industry was based on the advice of her mother, who had always told her to keep away from it, told her to, you know, leave this, this, all this uh, fame of the dunya and, and look to the deen and, and what she had been taught in terms of what, what hijab was and what it really meant. You know, it, it meant to, it was meant to be a barrier, not, not a symbol that can be flaunted on fashion magazines and you know credit to Halima Adin who has come out and she spoke out against her regret in what she has done and how she's left the industry and she's spoke out against the industry itself and many sisters alhamdulillah are looking up to her uh, as uh, you know as an example so following the death of uh, Khadija and obviously Abu Talib initially um, this left the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very precarious situation and um, specifically with Abu Talib, who was the head of uh, Banu Hashim um, and a, a leader of the Quraysh, um, he, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had lost his protection for the da'wah. And when um, Abu Talib died, um, Abu Lahab, his other uncle, but obviously an uncle who was ardently against the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what he was calling to, he became the uh, leader of Banu Hashim. And... Um, obviously, this um, in itself sounds uh, a, a 
a big challenge in the sense that Abu, Ta- Abu Lahab was a, a clear enemy of Islam. However, in some narrations, um, it is said that Abu Lahab, uh, due to his newfound responsibility, uh, f- he felt that he had a duty to protect the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he even told the me- messenger that to do as he did during the time of Abu Talib, and that he would provide protection. However, this didn't last long because um, Abu Jahl heard of this, and he went and he spoke to Abu Lahab, and he explained to him that the reason that you're giving your protection to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is due to tribal reasons. Obviously, it's because of his tribe. Uh, however, Muhammad sallam, he doesn't believe in tribe or he doesn't honor the tribe because he believes uh, Abdul Muttalib is destined for the hellfire. Who's obviously Abdul Muttalib is the father of Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab then went to the Messenger sallam, and he asked the Messenger. He said, "Where do you believe Abdul Muttalib is, and who is he with?" Um, and the Messenger sallam, he responded, "He is with those before him." And he didn't really say anything more than that. And Abu Lahab, he took this as an answer and he thought, oh, okay, that's fine, nothing negative. But when he went and told Abu Jahal, Abu Jahal, you know, mocked him and said, you know, do you not understand what this means? This means that Abdul Muttalib, your father, is destined for the hellfire because those before him, the Muslims believe, are upon, you know, ignorance and upon, um, not upon the deen or Islam or even uh, the previous, uh, of the previous scriptures. So, uh, when um, Abu Jahl again through his whispering he was able to convince Abu Lahab Abu Lahab then removed his protection and he told the Messenger Sallallahu that he was you know he's not going to give him protection and he doesn't want him to continue with his uh, call to Islam so uh, as a result obviously he removed his protection and uh, the environment again became very restrictive and the da'wah became stale and the Quraysh really became even more brazen against Islam and the Messenger himself, where even the common folk amongst Quraysh began to persecute the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger was left with no support at all for the Dawah or for himself. So that is what led to the third incident, because the Messenger, he left for Mecca and he uh, approached the tribe of Banu Thaqif, who are from the region of Ataif. Uh, to support his mission and to provide protection. And it's worth just noting here that uh, some people have claimed that the Messenger Sallallahu was seeking power from Banu Thaqif as though he was uh, wanting to uh, implement Islam uh, upon them or through them. However, this is incorrect. Um, this was not what the Messenger Sallallahu was doing. It was merely a protection for the Dawah. And, and you know all of these examples were given really highlights. is the fact that Abu Lahab passed away uh, and then Abu Jahl, uh, Abu Lahab even removed his protection, uh, showed that the Messenger Sallam was really seeking protection of the da'wah and not power. Because um, as we will find, uh, the Islam cannot be implemented by force uh, on people who don't want Islam and whose thoughts have not been transformed yet. Uh, we will find from this when we speak about uh, the da'wah and the especially what happened in Medina, is only when the thoughts and concepts and convictions of the people change from kufr to Islam, can Islam be implemented and can power be given to Islam. It isn't forcibly sought through military coups or whatever it may be. So this is a gross uh, misunderstanding of the seerah. Um, the Messenger of Islam, in fact, went to Banu Thaqif for protection of the da'wah only. And obviously, since he had lost protection from Abu Talib and even Abu Lahab, he went to protect to seek protection from elsewhere. So he pr- approached the tribe of Banu Thaqif, who lived in Ataif, and he went with his adopted son, Zayd ibn Haritha. And he went in the secrecy of the night. He didn't want the Quraysh to notice that he had left. So he approached three brothers who were the leaders of Banu Thaqif. And he invited them to Islam and asked them for their support and protection. Um, and subhanAllah, they didn't respond positively. They rejected the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not just in just mere rejection, in the rudest of ways. Uh, the first leader, he said, the first brother, he said, you know, I'm going to tear apart the clothing of the Kaaba. How dare Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala send you as a prophet? And obviously what he means by this is that the, the Kaaba to them is sacred and the clothing of the Kaaba is sacred. So he's saying that I can't, I cannot accept you to be uh, the a prophet, and if, if if this is the case, I'm willing to tear the clothing of the Kaaba. And the second among them said, 
did not Allah didn't Allah find anyone better to send you? So a clear mockery and ridicule of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then the third one said, uh, "I cannot speak to you because if you're a messenger, I don't think I'm qualified to speak to you. And if Allah has not sent you as a messenger and you're lying, then it's not appropriate for me to speak to a liar." So they rejected him wholeheartedly in the rudest of ways. And subhanallah, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam stood up to leave. Uh, because obviously he's been rejected, but he told them that, you know, it's fair enough you're rejected, no problem, but at least keep this meeting meeting a secret and don't reveal this to the Quraysh. Um, however, instead of keeping it a secret, they sent out their children, their slaves and the kind of the riffraff of society, they sent him out and they to curse the Messenger Sallallahu and to pelt him with stones. And obviously Zayd ibn Haritha was with him and he's trying to protect the Messenger as much as he could, but both of them, they were, you know, they were struck with these stones and they bled severely, uh, and and the blood, you know, poured down them, their body all the way down to the heels, and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, his his sandals were soaked in blood, uh, until they found a, a, a garden nearby where they sought refuge. So Subhanallah, it just shows that uh, the situation that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found himself in, and. Um, he was going through these trials and tests and no wonder that this year is called the year of grief and the year of sorrow because of the immense distress caused. Um, so in this, uh, you know, in this incident when the Messiah Salam uh, found refuge in this garden, he, he um, you know, made a heartfelt dua to Allah. Uh, to paraphrase and to kind of translate the dua, he said, O oh Allah, to you do I complain of the weakening of my strength. Uh, of my few options and of the way the people have humiliated me. O most merciful of the merciful ones, you are the Lord of the weak ones and you are my Lord. So he's just saying to Allah that only do I complain to you, no one else. And he said, to whom will you entrust me? To a distant stranger who will show me an unwelcoming face, meaning the people of Ataif, or to an enemy whom you have given control over my situation, meaning Abu Lahab, the chief of Banu Hashim. So then he went on to say, if you are not angry with me, then I do not mind, though safety from you is easy for me. And I seek refuge with the light of your face, which brings light to darkness, and upon which the affairs of the world and the hereafter become right, from your anger descending upon me and from your displeasure befalling me. And I will continue to seek your pleasure until you become pleased with me. And there is neither might nor power except with you. And subhanAllah, it really shows that Allah, um, the Messenger of Allah is complaining to Allah, but he's saying to Allah that I, I'm only, you know, as long as you're pleased with me, as long as you're happy with me, I'm able to bear the hardship. It really shows the mentality of the Messenger of Allah. And even in the dua, you know, he's, there's a slight nervousness that, you know, are you happy with me? Am I doing what's right? You know, as long as you know, I'm seeking refuge from your anger, from your displeasure, and uh, as long as you uh, are pleased with me, and I, I will continue to do this as long as you're pleased. So it really shows that this is the mentality that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, and the mentality that we should have in our situation, uh, where we're going through the trials and the hardships and the vicious attack against Islam. And the Muslims, we must remain steadfast, like the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and only do what is, and Allah requires from us, and only do what pleases Allah. And our concern should just be this, as you know, as much as the attack becomes vicious and we are um, being, uh, you know, attacked left, right, and centre, uh, we should continue, and have this kind of unshakable resolve that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. You know, not just the year, um, not just the event of Ataif, but also you know the calamities that befell him. Um, the, today, the enemies of Allah are physically attacking the Muslims all around the world, and there's a, a fierce intellectual attack on Islam. You know where they're trying to make Muslims apostate, apostatize from Islam, and to embrace secularism, which is essentially their religion. And you know they have come out and spoken out against the political aspect of Islam. They've said that. You know, in France and in Austria, they want to ban political Islam. And why is this? Not because they uh, have all of a sudden uh, realized that 
uh, what the true Islam is, they recognize that Islam in its true sense is political. And in fear of this, they want the Muslims to uh, apostatize from this true Islam and embrace an Islam that is very secular, that is detached from reality and detached from the affairs of people and politics. And that is why uh, they want Muslims to leave that and, and they want to ban uh, the political aspect of Islam. And that's why we should question to ourselves that why, why is it that they're happy with us praying and doing the ritual aspects of Islam, but they aren't, they're not happy with the political aspect of Islam? Isn't this the nature of the enemies of Islam? That they, are only, they only fear that which causes a threat, that which they know to be the truth. When it came to Quraysh, obviously, they, uh, they realized that it was the status quo that was going to change due to Islam. It was the fact that Islam was challenging their way of life. They didn't have any concern with the worshipping aspects of Islam. In fact, there were many non-pagans in Quraysh society, Christians and other religions, that they happily, they, you know, they didn't have any problem with this. What they had a problem with, problem with uh, Islam was, the political aspect of Islam and it really shows the comparison we can make that the Quraysh had this problem with uh, this pol- politics of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the fact that it was causing a clash likewise the enemies of today they have this same concern and that is why they're trying to ban it and again you know we have to have this unshakable resolve we have to have this um, stance where we're able to uh, carry on and not feel, uh, you know, like we need to fall into despair, despite our situation. Um, so, this is the mentality that Messenger Sallam had. He had tawakkul in Allah. He made dua to Allah. Uh, and one thing to note is that only after he did action, you know, only after he went and tried to seek support from a taif from the people of Banu uh, Thaqif, did he make dua to Allah. And this is something that is coming across the era that only when um, the Messenger of Islam plans and he does the action, then he seeks uh, support from Allah. Obviously, it's through Allah. And even through our actions, it's going to only be through Allah. And, but we have to carry out the action. We have to do what is required from us and then have that tawakkul, then have that reliance upon Allah. So this is what the Messenger of Islam did. And following this dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered, answered it. And he sent uh, the angel Jibreel السلام, and the angel of the mountains. And Jibreel came and said to the Messenger وسلم, that Allah has sent the angel of the mountains to him to order the angels to do whatever he wanted. Basically, he said, if you wish for the two mountains either side of Mecca to fall upon the people of At-Taif, uh, we will make it happen. And subhanAllah, what was the Messenger Sallallahu response? And this really highlights his main mission and what he is really concerned about. He didn't say, yes, can destroy them, what they have done to me. You know, his, the blood was still seeping from his body. It hadn't dried yet. He, he was, you know, he had gone through so much pain. What did he say? He said, no, I instead hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring out from their progeny those who will worship Allah alone and associate nothing with him. SubhanAllah, it just shows that even though he went through this physical attack, he went through immense pain and ridicule and mockery, he still wasn't thinking about himself. But he was thinking about mankind. He was thinking about the da'wah. He wished for the people of at to eventually, in the future generations, to embrace Islam. And SubhanAllah, you know, this is really shows that as da'is, as da'wah carriers, that we should all be. We should always remember why we're on this mission. What is our purpose in this mission? It's not for ourselves. It's not for pers- our personal gain. It's not for our egos. It's purely for the pleasure of Allah. And we will go through situations where, you know, we will be personally attacked. We'll feel like there is, uh, you know, attack on our ego. And it's natural to have this uh, natural kind of dislike for this. But we should always remember that we're in it for Allah, to please Allah. As long as Allah is happy with us, who cares about the people? Hasbin Allah wa ni'mal waqil, ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal nasir. Allah is sufficient for us and he is the best disposer of our affairs. What an excellent protector and what an excellent helper Allah is. You know, this is the mentality we should have. That we do it for the sake of Allah and Allah alone and the pleasure of Allah. 
no matter what the people think or do or no matter the personal attacks we may face physically and intellectually we will carry on and subhanallah the wish of the messenger what he had hoped for exactly happened uh, the people of banu thaqif ended up embracing islam after the battle of hunain and from the people of banu thaqif you know one clear example that we can relate to is uh, we, we many of us owe our islam to this man it was none other than muhammad bin qasim a thaqafi so he was the man who liberated the region of Sindh, which is modern-day India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, this kind of South, South Asian re- region. And, you know, it was through him that many of us, embrace, you know, our forefathers embraced Islam. And if it wasn't through him, no, you know, we don't know. Would we be Hindus worshipping monkeys and elephants? Who knows? But it was through this man, Banu, uh, through Muhammad bin Qasim, at thakafi that you know, Islam came to these lands, and if if the people of Banu Thaqif were destroyed, then this wouldn't have happened. So it really shows the foresight of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that for him it was about the pleasure of Allah. For him it was about the da'wah, his mission to succeed, because that's why he was here. It wasn't personal. It wasn't for himself. It wasn't for his ego. It's for mankind, and that is why he is a rahmatulil alamin, a mercy to mankind. You know, and Following this, despite not being able to gain protection from Banu Thaqif, the Messenger Salam didn't stop in his da'wah. You know, he, he took refuge in this garden. And in this garden, he actually gave da'wah to a Christian man named Addas, uh, who was an Iraqi servant of the Qurayshi tribesmen who actually owned the garden that they were sitting in. Um, and, you know, they sent him to offer Muhammad Salam and Zaid bin Haritha grapes as a gift because obviously they saw what had happened. And when um, this slave or the servant, Adas heard that the Messenger Salam, he said Bismillah when he had the grapes, it struck up a conversation. He said, you know, what, why did you say Bismillah and where is this from? And the Messenger Salam really highlighted, he showed to him, he said, he said oh, you're Christian uh, from Iraq. He asked him who he was from. And the Messenger Salam spoke about uh, the Prophet Yunus, Ibn Mutta. And he explained that, you know, this Prophet was also from Iraq. And due to this, uh, Adas became very surprised like no one would know this in this region and uh, through this he embraced islam because he, he knew that uh, the messenger of must have been a prophet because he, no one else would know this and subhanallah it just shows that even through this situation the messenger of continued to give da'wah and continued to spread islam even um, it is said there's narrations where when he was back on his journey from uh, taif a community of jinn heard his recitation of quran and they embraced Islam. And this story is mentioned in Surah Al-Jinn and Surah Al-Aqaf, where um, you know, the jinn heard this message, and I think they were Jewish jinn, and they heard that the Messenger had come after Musa, السلام, and they, he came to affirm his message, and they embraced Islam, and they became messengers for the people of other, for the jinn kind. Um, and there's a clear symbolism here that you know, even though the people rejected Muhammad Sallallahu even though the Quraysh were rejecting the Muslim by and large, you know, the jinn were accepting Islam. Someone from as far as Iraq had embraced Islam. And this is what we should recognize that we have to just do what is in our ability to the best of our, our ability. The results, we don't know. It's not in our control. And perhaps something better may come. Often we may be given that over to someone. And, you know, you're focusing on that one person trying to. Uh, you know, guide them to doing what is right, but someone else hears, and their small brother or someone else may hear, and they seem to be even greater in the da'wah, and even though they weren't our focus. And that is why we just need to do what we need to do, and Allah has given us this duty, and we need to carry on doing this duty, and whatever the results happen, we do our best, and you know, we leave the rest to Allah because they will be good as long as we do good. So, to conclude the session, we've kind of spoken about lots today. And taken some key lessons. Um, just before we conclude, you know, the Messenger Salam had now had to re-enter Mecca, and the Quraysh obviously found out about the secret meeting with Taif and how it went. So this situation became even more difficult for the Messenger Salam. He needed protection for himself and the Dawah, and this in itself further proves that the Messenger Salam was not seeking power; he was seeking protection for himself and the Dawah. And um, th- eventually he gained it. He, he asked three people, 
um, two people declined and gave like some excuses of why they couldn't protect him uh, from from the pagans. Um, and then the final person, Mut- um, Ibn Mutam Ibn Uday, he accepted the request of Muhammad. Sallallahu he gave him the protection, and um, he was able to enter the uh, enter Mecca eventually. Um, and you know, this really concludes the event. And the next episode, we will speak a bit about mm. how the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recognized that the Dawah became very stale in uh, Mecca. And since the death of Abu Talib and since losing that protection of the Da'wah, um, you know, he gained protection for himself from Mut'am, but not for the Da'wah really. Um, it became very difficult to break through in Mecca. Um, so he went through other, um, you know, he, he went on to seek protection from other tribes, which we will speak about. So Alhamdulillah, I covered lots and lots of lessons and I pray that you've benefited. Um, you know, I, I, like I always say, please share with others, follow and sub- subscribe subscribe to all our uh, social media channels. Um, inshallah, I call you Hada, what's the fill of law? Will you come while he said in Muslim, a first the fill who in the who have a full Rahim, a salam, or Ali, come Rahmatullahi, Wabrakatu. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.